Yeah. So I will record the lecture for those uh, for the future reference, and I hope everyone is here. But just in case someone wants to review it, so um, we will start with kind of a discussion a little bit about a simple, much simpler system, uh, which is like uh, messaging. Okay. So if you think of messaging, uh, we typically talk about push or pull models. So can you tell me what is the difference? And can you tell me, um, give me examples of uh, pull and push that, um, that you know, like that you use every day? Uh, you can type, you don't have to talk. Yeah, Tomas. I would say that the, the difference is that uh, that uh, push uh, messaging is kind of the initiated from the sender. Like, for example, uh, a mobile application getting a, a push notification mm -hmm. uh, when something happens. And pull messaging, I would treat as the opposite that the, 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 the receiver kind of uh, checks the, checks the, if, the, if there is any new messages available. Like, yep. uh, let's refresh the, the, the email list from the server. Okay, so do you know a POP3 protocol for emails? That works in a kind of a pool model, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, IMAP kind of works in a pool model as well. I mean, you open a client and then the client checks uh, what is there, but IMAP has kind of a more of a dual uh, purpose. But yeah, those examples are really good, right? So we have kind of a, a push notifications uh, on mobile in mobile space and we have kind of email as an example of a kind of a pull messages right so if you think about it um with the push notifications what needs to happen like for the mobile app to get the message what needs to happen i mean the app needs to be up right so if the app the application on the mobile phone is not up or the phone is down the phone cannot receive the push notification, right? So kind of a, a prerequisite is the client um, needs to be up, right? Uh, what happens if my phone is off? What will happen with push notifications? Yeah, Thomas again. I, I would say that it, it depends on the implementations, like in a Discord that we are using, they are gone. Yeah, so... But I could imagine that they could be queued in some uh, some place when you are up again, but then you will get not get uh, the push message, but you will get, you have to kind of the, use the pool model to, to, to update what you have missed or maybe something in between. That's right, yeah, very good. So we have an option of basically failing. So if a destination is not up and we try to deliver a message, we say, okay, yeah, the, the, the customer was not up, so we just drop it. Uh, we can queue it and resend it uh, when the mobile application is up, or we can have something um, like we can queue it and then let the client to pull it, right? We can switch back to a pull me method uh, plus queuing, right? Um, or something kind of like um, like uh, um, something in between those three models. Because if we queued too much, maybe we need to start dropping. Like if we are queuing and queuing and queuing and the client is never coming up, maybe the client will never come up, right? So we may need to start dropping messages. If we queuing and the client never pulls the messages, again, maybe we need to start removing them from the queue and so on, right? So we have kind of a, a little bit of a complexity here already, right? Um, so if we 
think about it, uh, there is a number of things that we need to consider, right? So I have uh, listed them here. Um, we need to first define what is a message. Uh, we need to think of the protocol that we will be using. Uh, we need to think of how we address uh, the destination, um, how to deal with clients being offline, and then who is the, uh, the intermediary for storing or queuing the messages, right? Um, so if, yeah, we also need to list some of examples. So Discord uh, is, well, Discord itself is a kind of a complex um, system because you have kind of a real world chat using the chat rooms. So it is both pull and push. Uh, you have the notifications on the mobile app, which have a push notifications. Um, and then you have the kind of the um, peer to peer mode where I can exchange messages with a kind of a destination. And also the client being offline allows me to queue the messages. And then when the client comes up, they can pull it, right? So it's already kind of an example of a very complex um, push uh, and pull um, methodology. We have email, which has been mentioned. Um, what else? Where do we kind of use the notion of messages? Uh, what other examples can you give? We could say SMS, uh, simple sh or short messaging subsystem or system from uh, um, a 2G network. It kind of started, I, I think it was 2G, uh, maybe even in 1G it was available. Uh, what else? So Discord, you know, slash messenger, slash WhatsApp, same story. Um, some of you might still use IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Do you know how this one works? It's very similar to the modern mess messaging apps, but there is a um, small difference. Um, in the in such a, that it is based on uh, relay servers which are connected with each other and they relay the messages right so I can connect to one of the servers and then send message to a kind of a destination and if that destination is not on that server it will be relayed to the server which has my destination and the message will be relayed. Uh, but it is exactly the same um, with email, right? We have the SMTP protocol and we have based on relay servers, right? So we have servers which follow the protocol and um, SMTP uh, and they relay the message. So for example, if I connect to an NTNU mail gateway ma mail server, and I'm sending a message to someone, I don't know, in the US, uh, in another campus. And they, let's say they don't, uh, they, they have a campus email, right? So I'm sending my mail to my NTNU uh, server. The server checks who is responsible for that particular domain, for that particular address that I'm emailing to. And they will look up the server to whom to forward my message and then they will forward it. And then that might be the server that the, my friend is using, or it might be another kind of hop from which he will be retrieving the mail. So this, this server might forward the message to another one. So usually you have like two or three or more hops, which the mail is doing uh, to be delivered to the final destination, right? And it's the same with IRC. Like uh, you may have uh, one, two or three kind of uh, jumps or hops. Um, do you have the same with SMS? Uh, no, you like the SMS is kind of delivered uh, normally by the operator, but what if I go to Spain 
and Thomas is SMSing me when I'm in Spain. Well, the SMS will go to the to Thomas's local Norwegian operator. Then it will go to the operator that I'm hooked up in Spain, and then that operator will deliver it to me, right? So this one is also based on relay um, servers, you may say, plus some uh, standard protocol that allows this interoperability to happen. So those three are kind of different, and this this category is a little bit different as well, right? Um, what is the difference? Um, so here we have, which one of these uh, would you consider decentralized? And which ones of these would you consider centralized? And what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, I would say that uh, the Discord and Messenger and WhatsApp stuff is uh, centralized. Mm -hmm. uh, because it all passes through the, um, the same server in theory yeah. or multiple servers uh, while the others can rely on relays. So they will be kind of decentralized. Yeah, perfect. So messenger, WhatsApp um, and so on. They are kind of examples of that. And then we have um, centralized. So we have all those other ones like email, um, we had what we did have else. We had an email, SMS, and IRC uh, because they don't rely on a single server to work. They can work even if one of the servers goes down, right? So here we, we say uh, even if most servers go down, um, the system works. Um, what's even more, uh, true for email and IRC. Um, so even if you are the only operator, operator, the system will continue to work. What does it mean? I mean, even if the wor world goes completely berserk and there is no email server ever anymore. You can set up your own Linux and you can set up your own single mail server and the system will continue to work with this just one server that you just set up yourself because the protocol is there and all the clients follow the protocol and as long as they con can connect to your server you can basically send emails to each other, right? Uh, so you don't rely on any third party for the system to work, right? Uh, that is not really true uh, with SMS, although there is kind of uh, an open BTS. Um, so for SMS, you can kind of do the same thing. Like you can become your own 2G operator by having some open hardware um, deployment for the uh, radio uh, transmitters. And then you can basically offer the same thing. We, we did that in New Zealand. We had bought um, some open BTS box and we were able to set up our own um, 2G network and kind of send messages and relay calls uh, using our own um, equipment. You are kind of allowed to do that if the power of the antenna is very small and your range is kind of very local, then you don't need like a regulatory permission from your country to be operating <laughs> kind of a 2G network. Um, so, you know, in theory, that is also possible. Whereas in this case, if uh, Discord decides not to sub, you know, um, support the service or if um, Facebook decides, okay, we're shutting down, then there is nothing users can do, right? So it is kind of a third party owned and operated. Um, and then they decide if the service is up or if the service is down. Uh, and then nobody else can do anything if they decide to shut it down or if they decide to censorship it, right? Um, so in terms of redundancy, uh, they usually don't have a single server. They usually do redundancy by distributing the load across multiple servers for the same reason those systems are decentralized, but this property still stays, right? Um, 
All right, so um, we kind of highlighted some uh, pros and cons here, um, and we see some properties like the one of the kind of a stakeholders being in charge, right? So, so here we have a kind of a central, uh, um, certain imbalance uh, between uh, the owners and the users, right? Um, whereas here, this is more blurred because um, you may not really need an owner, right? Um, so the ownership and users uh, is more complex. Um, so you, you don't remember that, but like I remember the, the internet without those central uh, gatekeepers uh, before Google and before Facebook and, and so on. And when Google came about and Google said, you can have email with us, but you will rely on Google servers and it, the, the email will be tied to this particular server. Uh, I and many other people were like, you know, really surprised, like it's not gonna work. Like who, yeah, who who's gonna let a, a third party company host all the emails if you can just do it yourself at home? Like uh, at the time we all had our own uh, mail servers and you know, we were happy <laughs> using email without this one single gatekeeper, right? Um, there is a factor though. Uh, so there is a convenience factor, convenience, uh, which is not to be neglected, right? Having your own mail server requires a little bit of electricity, a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of our time that you kind of maintain it, right? Um, and also you need to be connected to the network all the time. Um, so, you know, so, some of the benefits here kind of make sense. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe we should put convenience as a benefit um benefit here so but whoops but it is um but it is a little bit uh weird if you think about it because the entire internet all the protocols and all the machinery was kind of designed for internet to be decentralized um we as a humanity we made it more centralized out of convenience uh, because it simplifies certain things. It makes certain things easier. Um, but it, it was not the kind of the primary design, okay? So let's keep that thought and let's move on. Um, so let's talk about how do you make something happen? Like if you really want something to happen, how can you do this? So a, a trivial example to get it started is you have a flight tomorrow morning and you want to wake up. You, you need to wake up tomorrow morning, right? What do you do? Well, you set up an alarm clock, right? Um, if you're a little bit more paranoid, you set up two alarm clocks just in case one fails, right? Let's say you have one based on <laughs> electricity. You have like a radio watch, uh, which is plugged in and you say, well, what if there is a cutoff tomorrow morning? I'm gonna miss my flight. So you also set up your wristwatch, right? So you have backup, but that's okay. Like it, it kind of works. Like you will use technology to ensure that something happens, right? But what if you want more complex things to happen? Like, and they are not, necessarily related to you, you want something to happen, what can you do? You can use, I don't know, many, many alternatives uh, at, one, uh, at once. Mm. Yeah, give me examples. For example, if you want to invest in the cryptocurrency, let's yeah. say, then you want to have a very different wallets uh, because uh, uh, cryptocurrency now is not reliable. And one company is a failing, one company is a succeeding. So, and if you want to keep it like 10 years, let's say, then you want to put it in the 10 different companies' wallets, you know? Uh, I mean, without relying on one or two companies. Okay, that, that, that is a good point. So you kind of basically are talking about diversification. Uh, of portfolio such that you are 
independent of a single um, to to um, to be independent from kind of a single currency or single provider, right? Um, that that is a valid point. But what I was looking for is more of a kind of a mechanical means for ensuring that some action or something takes place in the world. Uh, so, for example, if you um, yeah, what what can I give you without like uh, guiding you too much? <laughs> uh, so you want something to happen. You want like in in this case, I I understand what you're saying. Like you want your portfolio to grow or you want to retain some value, right? And then you kind of are diversify, diversifying your portfolio. That that's fine. But like make it more trivial. Like you want. Um, you know, you want a meeting to happen or you want some bugs to be fixed in your project or you want the homework to be done. Like, what do you do? Like, how do you ensure that something gets done, that something happens? So, there, yeah. There, yeah? Um, I was just thinking if you're going into the terms of kind of either making a deal or a promise with someone, I guess, uh, is that where you're going at? Yes, uh, partially. So you can um, you can agree to a deal or uh, issue a promise. All right, that's fine. What else? Uh, contract, I guess. Uh, that's on an even more legal. You can have a contract with someone. Yeah, so, a legal contract. So legal contracts or kind of an informal contracts, right? Like you can. Uh, you can agree that you will come to the lecture tomorrow, right, with me, and we we have a deal, right? So it is kind of a, a little bit related to the one above, right? What else? And you have also a court in in the worst case scenario. I don't know. Is it uh... legal contracts? You have courts to enforce the yeah. contracts. Yeah. You what have else? A, you have fines, or I don't know, uh, punishments, yeah. or yeah. something like this. Yeah. That's that's fine. Yes. What else? So let's add this alarm clock example. You can use kind of a calendar to, to give you a notification, which is sort of similar to, to the alarm clock, right? So you can use calendar on your phone with a push notification reminder. Okay. What else? Some trusted authority that will solve it kind of like works like the court, but yeah. Uh, it doesn't need to be a court, just um, you know, some third party. Yeah. So you can, for example, say, if I die, I want my car to be given to my wife. Okay. And you want to guarantee, you want to ensure that it will happen. Like, what? Well, yeah, we kind of are looking for this, um, how to ensure that something gets done. Right. So you basically wrote a will. And you say, um, example, a will, right? Um, I want my car to be given to my wife and I want my computer to be destroyed or whatever, whatever you want, right? So you can use, you can use your solicitor to have something done after you died, right? Um, so you're effectively delegating some work to a trusted third party that will ensure that this happened, right? And then it is kind of uh, related to legal contracts and the courts and things kind of enforce it, right? You can do it informally. You can ask a friend. Um, so it is again uh, uh, here, you can ask a friend, right? instead of writing a will, you say, okay, you know, under those conditions, I want you to do this. And the friend will kind of agree or not agree, whatever, right? So it, that's another thing. So what else can you do? Uh, 
I think you could actually delegate uh, delegate uh, the, the deal on transaction to the third party. If I want to buy something over the internet, then oh. some this we bought one sending a part sending a money and the other sending the the goods to the to the kind of the middleware where oh. where to ensure that transaction happened. That's a good example. So we could uh, let's let's put eBay here, right? Um, so eBay example is that we have we do have a, a, a third party, but in fact we have more than one because um, the eBay itself is a is a third party, which kind of facilitates between me and the, the let's say I'm buying a car, right, um, on eBay. So I'm saying, okay, um, I'm gonna buy this car. Um, th this is the money, and then uh, the eBay facilitates the the transfer between the goods and the money, and also there is a shipping involved, right? So there is kind of a third parties uh, involved involved for facilitating facilitating the deal and shipping and uh, escrow of escrow of money goods right so to to ensure that nobody cheats right so i i'm not gonna pay before i get the goods and i mean that the seller doesn't get the money until they send it and whatever like you you do have certain things and then they also have some conflict resolution built in right so it is kind of um resolution um uh, so if if we consider eBay like a, uh, a facilitator, we have kind of a more complex guarantees on different levels which are kind of happening, right? Um, so I, I will kind of delete this one because it, it, it is true for the diversification, but it wasn't kind of the main point of the of the question. So can you think of of something more, um, something even more trivial? Um, so, uh, for example, vacuum cleaning, for example. Yeah, vacuum cleaning. Do you yeah, use Roomba? I can, I can turn turn on my robot uh, vacuum cleaning machine, and it will do it. That's it. exactly. Uh, let's call it just robot, right? Uh, so you basically said, okay, uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I want the robot to clean my room, and the robot will kind of do it, right? Uh, so automation through technology. Uh, that's a very good example of, of this, right? Um, another one, which I, I, I don't think you hear it, but I have um, an external drive and it's really busy uh, working because I have uh, an automated uh, backup system, which backs my laptop, right? So automated backup. Uh, again, automation through technology. And it happens like without my involvement, I just scheduled it and it will back up my computer like every hour, whatever the, the algorithm is. And it will kind of make sure that um, things happen, right? Uh, if you have a mobile email client, um, then usually you have to set how frequently it checks if you have new mail, right? So every 15 minutes, every one minute or every hour, right? So you kind of schedule schedule certain task on your laptop or mobile device, right? Um, so this is kind of an example of, you know, it will happen, right? Be again, it's kind of an automation through technology. Um, so if we kind of look at those examples, um, you see a, a certain pattern here. Uh, and the pattern is some of those are technology-based and some of those are not technology-based, right? <laughs> it's kind of an obvious, right? So this one, this one, this one, and eBay, well, eBay is kind of a complex case, right? So those three are clearly non-technology-based. Like even before the era of computers, you could have those three, right? Uh, you don't need computers for any of that, or you don't really need technology for any of that. Um, the robot, the, the backups, things like this, 
and even the alarm clock or the automated calendars, they do, uh, let me move it, they do require technology. Uh, without technology, you cannot really do it, right? And then eBay, yes, eBay is probably a bit of a mixture uh, because it does involve technology, but it also involves kind of a third party and some legal obligations and things like this, right? So this is a kind of a more complex. But we have kind of a technology-based and non-technology-based. And what we kind of see here uh, that it's obvious that this one is sort of a replacement for the trusted third party, right? We don't need a third party. Uh, we kind of delegated the task to a robot or delegated the task to some sort of automation, uh, which, which basically makes it happen. Um, in here, we have to trust that it will happen because of some human will, that the, the humans who are kind of responsible for ensuring it will kind of deliver it, right? Um, so what is the, um, yeah, so the, we kind of covered that. Um, and another example is a vending machine, right? So a vending machine is kind of a more complex uh, guarantee that something will happen, but it's, it will not happen like for you, it will happen between kind of a customer and the machine. And you, if you are the owner of the vending machine, you kind of guarantee, you delegated this kind of a enforcement to the vending machine, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, you all know like how vending machines work. So now the question is, um, will that happen? Will that guarantee, like how much guarantee you have in all of those examples that it will happen? So for example, in, in the um, alarm clock, how sure are you that your alarm clock will work tomorrow morning if you have a flight? Well, you're pretty decently sure, but I usually, if, if I, um, like I, I either use the wristwatch or I use a wristwatch with some uh, physical backup, like a alarm clock uh, additional backup because the wristwatch usually is quite quiet and I may kind of sleep through it, right? Um, so I do use some redundancy because I am not, I'm not 100% sure, right? Um, how about uh, Oscar with your robot? Is your robot always cleaning the floor or sometimes the robot says, oh, I got stuck and I couldn't clean the floor, right? Um, it's not 100% guaranteed neither, right? Um, so at least for the technology-based ones, we can see that the guarantee is not 100%, okay? Um, ever happened to you that you ask a friend to do something and it, it kind of didn't happen? <laughs> yes, it's not 100% neither. With legal contracts and with courts, well, most of the time it happens, but you do have people breaking the contracts and uh, things getting to court and things not getting done, right? Um, so, yeah, the bottom line is that neither of those have kind of a 100% guarantee. It is, um, it, it is probabilistic that something will happen or not, right? Uh, it, it is the same with vending machine. The vending machines get stuck, right? Um, so sometimes things don't work out the way it should. And what can we do about it? Um, Well, we use redundancy, right? So as, as I explained with alarm clock, I usually use, use two if I really, it's something important for me, like I'm missing a flight. Um, so with trusted third parties, it, it kind of is the same. They kind of give you a certain guarantees or certain assurances. And for example, if you're putting your money into a bank, uh, the banks have ratings. Some are very trustworthy and some are kind of not trustworthy. So that's why financial institutions have kind of a ratings and guarantees, right? Um, uh, redundancy, that's what Oscar kind of started with. Like if you want something to happen, uh, you need to 
diversify and kind of split yourself because you don't have guarantees on individual things, but overall they kind of compound and some of the emerging guarantee kind of will happen, right? So let's say um, I am a service provider and I'm handling people's emails, okay? And I have a mail server, they connect to my mail server and I kind of uh, offer them a service, okay? So what happens if um, my server breaks down? Like I have a failure, my, you know, my RAM got fried or something. Um, well, I need some redundancy, right? So I, instead of having a single web mail server, I have two. Okay, so now I have a kind of a, a better guarantee that if one of them has a physical failure, the other one can take over and I can continue continuity of the, um, of the operation of the service. Um, but what is the problem with this? How would you ensure your business, your kind of a mail server business to be even more resilient? Having two servers is not enough, right? Um, should I have three servers? What, what do you think? Like, how can I make my two server business for mail providing even better? Yeah, Tomas? Like 10, 10 servers. You can, you, I don't know, maybe hundreds or uh, the more the is the quantity, the, the more trustable. Uh, or more securities. Okay, so we have a case of one server, we have a case of two servers, and now um, let's say we have a case of five, ten, hundred, and thousand. Okay, is there a difference between me having hundred servers and thousand servers? <laughs> Realistically talking. Uh, there is a clear benefit of having two versus one, okay? Is there a benefit for me if I already have 100 servers to have 10 times more? Depends on how important is that uh, task or I don't know, uh, how important is that uh, contract or something like this. Yeah, other people? Tomas? Uh, oh, yeah. I think it, it's all about the, the the calculation of the costs and the, uh, and the, and the profits. Because no, no if, let's let's say uh, costs are no issue. Like I have uh, unlimited budget. I just want to make my system better. Okay, so let let's constrain it. So I have a mail business that offers offers email to clients. Okay, I'm Google and um, I just invented Gmail, okay? I just want it to be as reliable as possible. Uh, what should I do? Uh, so I started with one server and it crashed and I said, oh shit, I had a downtime. I like lost emails and things, right? So I moved to, to be, I have my room and I have two servers now. Um, so what, what's next? What can I do? Yeah, Tomas. Then we are talking about the uh, kind of the chain chain of the events uh, uh, because uh, all 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 of those kind of the sending emails or transactions uh, uh, it usually it doesn't depend on a single point or single transaction but it's a kind of the uh, things that happens uh, kind of the you, you you need to you need to make sure that it's not only a server but maybe you need to invest in the in the infrastructure to, to ensure that you have own electricity if, if the, the entire state goes down uh, and, and so on. So you, it kind of, you could, you could, you could uh, increase the, 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 the uptown, uptime with the, with investing in the, in the kind of along the, 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 the chain from yeah. the, from the client to that, to the service. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, Nikolai? Yeah, I was just going to point out that it's, especially if these servers are, um, like just said now, for example, at the same place and there there are, they could offer the same like electricity loss yeah. or something, but also that uh, it would get to a point where it's 
kind of diminishing to add more servers. It, it doesn't give too much extra. Exactly. No. Yes, exactly. So the 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 key the key uh, mention here is a kind of a diminishing returns okay so if i have my room and i have two servers adding a third server doesn't really improve me much okay i mean the probability of both servers fading physically in the same time is small to a point where you know, I, all, I will always have at some time to fix the one which failed with the one which is still running, right? Maybe three, okay? Uh, maybe having three is reasonable, but I would probably stop at two, right? But even if I have thousand servers in my room and electricity goes down, <laughs> like it didn't help much that I went from two to thousand, right? Um, if my house burns down, it doesn't help neither if I went from two to thousand, right? So for a particular setup adding more of the same has diminishing returns there is kind of a sweet spot probably around you know two three and then it doesn't make more sense right so having three servers in my room uh, is probably max but i should have another three servers in Tomas Tomasz's house in Lillehammer because you know the chances of my house burning down and his house burning down at the same time are very low, right? So maybe I should have two locations, right? Uh, I should have two locations and each location should have those two servers, right? Um, and then if my electricity supplier kind of uh, doesn't provide me electricity, maybe I should have two electricity suppliers per location, right? And maybe I should have two internet providers internet provider per location right um, so that kind of makes it much more resilient than just adding servers in my single location right so those things uh, become kind of the equivalence classes right within the single class making it more and more that ha has a diminishing return value like it doesn't make much more difference uh, some some you know going from one to two three makes a difference but going from three to two to more uh doesn't right um and then we want those equivalent classes to be independent right so for example if there is an earthquake chances are my electricity provider my internet provider uh, and my physical location may basically be destroyed, right? So for the earthquake, all of those are kind of the same because all of them will be destroyed at the same time. Um, but for example, between electricity provider and internet provider, there is certain independence, right? So if I want to be kind of an earthquake um, quake, uh, resilient, I probably would need to pick something on a different tectonic plate such that if I have earthquake on this tectonic plate, it has, it is independent from another tectonic plate, right? So having my set setup in Jovic and in Lillehammer is not really earthquake resilient because if there is a big earthquake and it affects this particular, you know, location, it will probably affect both, right? But in terms of electricity and some other factors, they are independent, right? So th this factor kind of how independent those qu classes are and how I am kind of making it resilient according to those classes kind of makes sense, right? Does it make sense? Yeah, so Ru also said, uh, I didn't see the uh, the comment uh, that spreading it around the world kind of makes sense, but it, it has to do with location and those other factors. All right, so that kind of, um, that was a one side comment. And then there is a second side comment about um, how blockchain really work. <laughs> this one is a bit longer. So. I will not ask you how blockchain work. I will tell you kind of very quickly, okay, it's, uh, to remind you. So we do have transactions which happen between some, uh, some parties. Uh, and for example, Bitcoin works in such a way that you have input and output um, 
flows of the of the coin of the of of the token which is in the in the blockchain um, and then this is sort of structured into blocks right um, so we have transactions we have inputs and outputs and then the the transaction diverts what was coming to the input to the outputs right on a very high level that's how it works um, and then the important part here is that um, the previous transaction had inputs and outputs and now I am making a new transaction and I'm spending those outputs. So I'm using them as the input to my transaction and then I'm diverting the funds somewhere else. Okay, let's say, let's say it's one to one, right? So somebody paid me. So somebody made a transaction from inputs to, the, to this output that I owned, right? And then if I want to spend those money, I'm, I'm making a new transaction, which is using this output as the input to my transaction, right? So the input really is the output of somebody's transaction plus a certain script, right? And this is kind of an important part. Uh, the important part is that it's not static things. It's not just state. It has a little bit of logic so this logic is guaranteed to happen, right? Um, so if we go to um, if we go to this um, website, um, you will see that it is kind of like a simple programming language, right? So Bitcoin script is like a very simple stack-based uh, programming language. What are the programming languages that are stack-based? Do you know? I know all of you know at least one, which is stack based. Um, you may not know that you know it, but so fourth is a very, you know, prominent example of a, a purely stack based programming language. You, everything you do feels like you're working with stack, but there is another class of languages which are also stack based because of the underlying uh, virtual machine. So, any any guesses? Yeah, so assembly depends. Most assembly languages are register-based, not stack-based. Uh, so the parameters to functions and to uh, to the operands are kind of passed. Yeah, Java, exactly. So in assembly, most things are kind of uh, register based, but Java is like JVM itself is a stack based um, virtual machine. And therefore everything which uh, we do is sort of operating on the stack uh, instead of registers. Uh, and they designed Java because they wanted it to be multi-platform. They didn't know what particular architecture on what particular register sets uh, implementation will have. So the specification is basically stack based. Um, so Java is a good example, good point to do. Anyway, uh, we have some operations and we kind of coding some logic. Uh, so we have some logical operators like you know, if statements, else statements, uh, we have verification uh, operands which co compare things for us. Uh, we can uh, operate on the stack, of course, so we can duplicate the value on the, on the stack and things like this, right? So I, I don't want to go too technical here. Um, I will kind of scroll down to the typical standard um, Bitcoin address which is effectively um, paying to a public key hash, okay? When Bitcoin started, uh, that was even simpler because we were paying to a public key. Uh, but this part of the script, uh, I mean the, the whole part, this, the whole part uh, of the script is already in the blockchain, right? Before it is spent. So if I go here, so when someone made this transaction, they put something here, which is the kind of the identification of the output. Um, and this identification of the output is this script. Uh, and if we think that we are paying to a public key, then the public key would be visible the moment someone spends 
the funds, right? Uh, and that has an undesirable property that it would be easy to look up uh, knowing some, someone's public key if they are receiving some funds or not, right? Um, if we hash it, this is kind of an, like hashed, so it's not in plain text, and uh, it's really hard to, you know, hash functions are one way, so it's really hard to compute what the public key is. So until the, this output is spent, the destination of this payment is unknown, right? So this public key is revealed when the payment is made, but not before. That's why we changed from paying to public keys to paying to public keys hash. But because of this change, that, that script is a little bit harder now. Because before we only needed to compare, um, we didn't need to do the hashing, right? We could only compare the signature to the public key. But now we, so the logic here is like this. Um, given the supply of the signature and the public key, we duplicate the public key, we hash this public key, and we compare this hash of this public key to this one which is in, already in the address. So th this is already here, right? Um, and when they match, we check the signature, okay? Um, so how does it how does it work it works by ensuring that if whoever was spending this money they put this hash of the public key here and the only person who can use these funds who can make this transaction is a person who has the private key and the public key of the hashed pu public key which is already here because otherwise this script wouldn't work, right? And to unlock it, they need to supply the signature and the public key. So here you have the kind of the logic of, um, of how it effectively works. Um, so the, th this happens when, uh, when this transaction is, is created for this input, right? So to make this input, you have to use the output of the previous transaction plus supply those two parameters to the script. So you need to reveal the signature and the public key. Uh, and then this is concatenated with the output from the previous transaction, and then it's executed. And th this is a program. This is a, a complete program. It has two parameters. And then it has, uh, actually it has three parameters, but this one was hard coded in the script and then it is executed. And the stack based programming languages basically do um, skip the, like the operations are put on stack. So this is on the bottom of the stack. Uh, you see bottom of the stack, then this is on the top of the stack. Then this operation is executed. So then that means this public key is duplicated. Uh, and then we are hashing the top parameter. So we have now this on the bottom. This is the next element. This is the top element because we hashed the, the previous public key. And then we run kind of a um, parameter again. So we put it on top of the stack and then we have the operation which verifies if they are the same. So if this hash and this hash are the same, we continue, if they are not the same, we fail. So, that, you know, we stop. Um, if they were the same, they are consumed from the stack and we are having final instruction left. And then on the stack, we have the signature and the public key. And the op check signature checks if this signature was kind of uh, valid, it's verified with this public key. But to generate the signature, somebody who created it needed to have, um, a private key for this public key. And then if this is fine, there is no more instructions to execute and the stack value is true because the return values for each operand goes back to the stack, right? Um, so this might be a little bit um, difficult, but you should kind of follow the, the logic of this. And the bottom line here is that the script, um, the script that is here, and the parameters that, oh, sorry, the, the script that is here and the parameters that I'm supplying 
to spend the funds are kind of arbitrary. I mean, we can design different scripts that do this mapping, right? So what does it mean? It means that I can have some logic which spends those funds the way I want and I designed in the logic of the script, okay? Um, so can you do some clever things with it? Um, of course you can do clever things with it, right? Uh, one of the more clever things that has been done is that someone um, decided to build a script in such a way that if you supply two arguments and they are different, so you, you know the script will compare if the argument one and argument two are different. If they are different, but when they are hashed, they are hashed to the same hash, that means that someone found a hash collision, okay? And this way you can unlock the funds and you can spend them to you, right? So the, the script basically works like this. Um, here it says, um, the, the, the logic is here, right? It says, if you give two arguments which are different, but they hash to the same value, you can unlock this output. And then this says, here are two parameters which are different, which hash to the same value, and I want the money. And it, I, I direct them to myself. I, I control this address, right? Um, so that's how the bounty kind of worked. <laughs> And it has been set in 2013. Um, and then in 2015, uh, somebody claimed the coins, right? It was 2.5 Bitcoins and somebody did that, right? Um, how clever is that? How, how do you like it? So, I quite liked it, but that's not the full story. I kind of hide extra text here. So if I <laughs> reveal it. Um, so what happened was in 2015, Google used its own machinery to demonstrate the SHA-1 collision, okay? So SHA-1 was and is one of the um, hashing algorithms that is used by Git and it's also very commonly used kind of everywhere because it was relatively fast and it was considered to be safe that you cannot force collisions okay and what happened was google used they have kind of you know enormous computing facilities so they brute force a hash collision and they published it and they say look we found a collision by doing some computations brute force computations that means the SHA-1, the 128 bits SHA algorithm is not really safe because someone with sufficient, sufficiently large computational powers can force the collision. And then someone used the results from, <laughs> from Google and, and kind of stole the 2.5 Bitcoins, not, not really stole because, you know, uh, they just took it, right? They supplied the, the same inputs which Google came up with and then they just got the money, right? <laughs> uh, so that is quite clever, right? And it, it is quite clever on, on multiple levels. So one level that it's clever is that um, the research output was kind of disseminated into the blockchain by a third party independently of Google, right? Uh, and that in itself is quite remarkable. Um, the other kind of normal thing is that if you think about this contract, if you think about this, uh, this setup, um, there is no way someone can steal those funds or someone can cheat the system. Someone can pretend to find a SHA-1 collision and somehow convince the court that they are right. There is no third party here. Um, the setup, the bounty is set up in such a way that if you have the data, you can demonstrate it. If you don't, you can't, right? Um, so you can sort of think about it as a kind of a contract between somebody who wants kind of a, a vulnerability to be exposed and somebody who exposes this vulnerability. It just happened in this particular case that the party which exposed the vulnerability was Google 
and the party who claimed the coins was not Google, but as, uh, you know, as they kind of elaborate here, if Google find out the vulnerability, they could have claimed the, the coins before publishing the result officially, right? Uh, they might have decided to publish it first and didn't claim the, the thing, whatever, right? Um, but it was possible for them to claim it uh, because this knowledge was not public. But once it became public, then of course, somebody's gonna take it, right? Um, and then the final thing is that it just happened, right? There, there was no... Um, there was no third party involved. There was no need for enforcement and like legal enforcement or court enforcement. It just kind of happened autonomously, right? Uh, like we can discuss the probability uh, kind of a guarantee of this happening, of this autonomous action happening, but it is for like, you know, modern standards very high, right? Um, it is, um, like if, if you think about it, what would take, uh, for this not to happen is that between, uh, 2013, uh, when it was announced and 2015, when it kind of happened that the Bitcoin stopped existing, that the entire Bitcoin blockchain sort of stopped and that nobody was mining it, nobody was trading it, nobody was doing anything with it, right? Uh, that the whole system just collapsed. Uh, then this wouldn't happen, like the, the action would not take place. But that's the only like requirement for this not to happen, right? Um, so I, I think this, um, this, and this independence are quite remarkable. Like we, it, it's kind of one of the examples where we see something being kind of a guarantee to happen without ability to be cheated by any human factors. Um, so let's move on. Um, so we, we kind of covered two things now. Uh, we covered, um, we covered the centralized and decentralized systems. And we said that in kind of, um, uh, when, when we kind of deal with it, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we have the sort of a technology and non-technology based kind of setups. And in the technology based ones, um, we do not have re re uh, reliance we don't rely on kind of a human factors. We rely on technological factors, which are not 100%. I mean, things can go wrong in technology, of course, but at least we eliminated kind of a dependence on human factors. Whereas with the non-technology one, even if we go to courts, like legal contracts and courts, um, there is a lot of fuzziness. There is a lot of uh, space for interpretation, right? Um, whereas in the technology ones, we don't have that. Uh, and especially like with, with this kind of um, setup here, there is no space for interpreting or kind of making some judgment. Like it, 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 it is or it's not, it's almost like math, right? Um, and we also demonstrated that like the kind of a vending machine is a good example of automation and kind of making things autonomous. Uh, and then contracts in, in a very trivial system like Bitcoin can be utilized for automating certain things. Uh, like one thing that it automated was this sort of bounty for hash uh, collision, but it also incentivized the development of this, right? So by finding this kind of a hash collision, you basically claim the reward, right? So we have kind of incentive models built in into this smart contract. I mean, in Bitcoin, they are not called smart contracts. They are just called scripts. Um, but the difference between a smart contract in Ethereum and a kind of a script in, in um, Bitcoin are not huge. Like they, they, like logically, they kind of do the same thing. They have different capabilities. Like in Ethereum, you can encode logic, which is very complex. 
in Bitcoin, you can encode logic, which is kind of limited complex. So the, you know, the instruction set, um, which Bitcoin has, allows you to do a lot, but not everything. Whereas the uh, instruction set in Ethereum allows you to do kind of almost everything. Uh, because it's kind of Turing equivalent, right? And you have some systems in between, in, in, you know, richer than Bitcoin, but not as rich as Ethereum. Uh, but, you know, the concept is kind of the same. Um, so we kind of went over those, um, those two topics. So the, the final topic for today is predictability. Um, so how can you, what can you use to predict the the future. What do you do to predict the future? So I'm a paragliding pilot. Uh, um, I spend every morning predicting what will be the weather today and tomorrow uh, by using the weather forecast services. Okay. Uh, so that's one example what, what I use uh, about the future, right? So weather forecast services. What do you use? to predict the future where else do you need to predict the future um i'm just not adding what else but you could look at historical uh estimations as well i think yeah to some degree that it, you... it wouldn't be a prediction but it would be a somewhat estimation i guess yeah, and in, in what concrete domains do, do you mean? Uh, for example, it could be weather, but it could be economics also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Econo economics, uh, let's say trading, uh, looking into models based on past behaviors. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Some statistics for uh, failure predictions for uh, uh, infrastructure. Okay. Uh, infrastructure failure prediction, also based on some historical data, right? Yeah, what else? So um, there is some correlation between kind of a stock market and markets like economical markets in general and US elections <laughs> or elections in general. Uh, so when there is, um, yeah, let's say it's a correlation between market behaviors and a major political decisions. So uh, it, it kind of works like this, that um, the markets um, expose um, kind of the, the level of unknown or kind of risk, right? So if there is kind of a high volatility of the market. That means that the decision that is kind of being taken independently of the market, of course, is kind of uh, unknown, is, is very risky. Uh, if the markets behave kind of a stable and kind of a consistent, that means the decision is probably already decided, like it's clear who will win or like what will happen, such that the, the unknown or risk factors are kind of small, right? Um, so uh, in the US, if the current leader will to be continued, the markets usually have kind of a pre uh, positive uh, um, behavior. If the current leader is supposed to be swapped for another one, usually the market's experiencing kind of a high volatility and high, high risk. So the, I, I don't remember exact statistics, but when they had the presidential elections like on like uh, 25 times, only twice that rule didn't follow, right? Uh, but by far this rule followed all, in all kind of a presidential kind of elections. 
uh, but you know it's not hundred percent like it may fail right um, so this kind of is is one um, one thing so what else can you do you can ask experts um, right so you can ask certain uh, experts of their opinion on what will happen and usually the experts like you you say um, you ask them uh, about a particular domain and because of the expert knowledge they usually have some insights and they usually are quite good predictors right um, what else what else can you do you can go with your own gut feeling right um, what does it mean it means you're not using any scientific methods you just kind of have uh, intuition okay uh, aka intuition that something will happen right um so for example again example from paragliding i'm flying and i have a choice to go a little bit left or a little bit right and i don't know where the updraft will be and usually i'm kind of making a decision based on some expert knowledge i i for example know that this like darker fields are more active and more probable for giving me the updrafts than the foresty areas and so on so i'm using all the kind of an expert knowledge and i'm using some statistics from the past behavior and all those things but sometimes i just have no reason and i go right okay I, I, I wait all the reasons and I cannot make the decision, but I have a kind of a feeling that I should go right or should go left. And then I do that, right? Uh, maybe it is to do with the feel you get from the wing or whatever that is, right? So usually this is um, because the decision process is complex uh, or is too complex uh, for for someone, for a person um, to use logic, right? Uh, that's why we, we do something without having a logical explanation of why we did something, right? Uh, some people hate this. Uh, some people are very friendly with doing things without logical explanations. So it, it depends a little bit about your personality, but that's definitely a way to... Um, Kind of uh, predict something, right? Uh, you might be wrong, you might be right. Um, so all of this is kind of interesting and there was a book published um, five years ago uh, called Super Forecasting. I, I had a kind of a chat yesterday a little bit about it with, with Tomasz uh, and I wanted to bring this book to, to the lecture as well. It, it is kind of a good book um, so if we go to the website of who Super Forecaster is, um, so, oh, come on, not this one. I want to go there, yeah. Um, so it is a technical term. A Super Forecaster is a person who makes forecasts about the future. Uh, and gives the forecast kind of a score, like a probability uh, of how this forecast will work, right? Um, and um, you, can, you can check it out. What is important is that, um, uh, so they, for example, used uh, super forecasting about the outcome of Brexit. Um, um, yeah, this one is not the, like, let's look at the second one about the book. Um, so this one basically says that, um, yeah, so the research suggests that accurately selected amateur forecasters um, were often more accurately tuned than experts. Um, so when you're making kind of a predictions about the future, uh, there is a class of amateurs that are better than experts, uh, but um, they, it, it doesn't have to do with their knowledge or with their skills, but more with their personality traits. So certain people are kind of, uh, they think in certain ways, 
which make them not to fall into traps of some biases and the judgment about the forecast is much more objective, right? So you can say that those people are kind of a super forecasters or that the, those people are, um, for example, um, more objective in their thinking. They kind of consider the weights of certain probabilities, distributions and certain events in a much more objective way than most of us because we, most of us have bias. Okay, uh, and then the, the book talks about the, the, the selection process and how those people are kind of are filtered out and um, they are usually working in, for governments because the best forecasters, they kind of help the government um, make decisions, but they are kind of a lay people. They are not, as it says, they are usually not experts. Uh, they are kind of amateurs and they are trained in special certain ways to use statistics and to kind of make uh, decisions. And then they are kind of more effective than others, right? Um, so if you kind of uh, think about it, you can say, well, if you could build a marketplace uh, which could help to filter out those kind of uh, super predictors, uh, super forecasters uh, to bubble up, then you can basically uh, have uh, a system which could be used to predict the future, right? Uh, and that's what one um, guy did a couple of years ago. Um, they've built a blockchain-based predictions trading platform where you can effectively trade and vote and make judgments on any arbitrary predictions, right? So again, if you go to the, um, if you go to the site, they have a mobile app, they have a kind of a, a web-based app as well. Um, and you can um, build kind of, um, you can offer a bounty for, for, for certain things, or you can uh, participate in predicting what will happen in the future. And it has to do with the values of the stock, with the um, whatever, you, you really have a lot of different, um, you, you can browse it after the lecture if you are more interested. Uh, I'm just kind of uh, pointing it out that um, smart contracts and kind of this automated kind of a trading and bounty system has been blown up to a point where you can actually do very serious uh, kind of uh, work with it. Uh, and the payouts and the payments are kind of out automated. Uh, everything is kind of uh, guaranteed on a kind of a protocol level. And you don't really need to trust anybody like the, the trust in a third party is sort of really diminished um, with, with, with this platform. Um, so there is another example that I will use to, to wrap it up. Um, you can bring this kind of notion of uh, bug bounties, uh, Patreon like as a uh, uh, source of funding for certain things that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know how Patreon works, right? And kind of a software development freelancing uh, together with blockchain and smart contracts and Git and have kind of a platform which does the same thing and it's called Gitcoin, right? Um, so Gitcoin is kind of like a platform which is mostly used by the blockchain enthusiasts, but it's not limited to blockchain. It, it can be used for any Git-based open source project. Uh, in itself is not a token or a coin. It's just a platform that links investors with the issues, um, sorry. Uh, with the issues with the bounties and with some sort of a support for developers. And then um, they have kind of a building process. Gitcoin is not as automated and as smart contract based as Augur is uh, because Augur is really uh, based on um, kind of a um, blockchain decentralized technology. Uh, they do use decentralized technologies, but there are certain things which are still human based. So some evaluations of uh, resources used or some plans or some contributions are kind of evaluated by humans, right? Not, not everything is kind of fully automated, but it is a very interesting take of the technology into the kind of the sphere of open source uh, projects and open source um, reward structures, right? Um, 
So Augur and Gitcoin are kind of the more advanced examples of where smart contracts and on-chain payment systems can be used to achieve, you know, certain effects, uh, certain effects in the world. All right, so um, to so sum up, um, we started with some decentralization uh, discussion and we were kind of uh, identifying some of the aspects that decentralization kind of offers. Um, and we moved on to dis discussing that decision-making and kind of uh, predicting events and you know, uh, doing certain things is, is very complex and nothing is kind of um, guaranteed. So uh, we do use simplifications of guarantees by mentally judging certain things as sure or kind of not possible. Uh, but in reality, uh, you know, you should always have a number. You should always have kind of a number associated with any forecast or with any kind of uh, technological solutions uh, and kind of work to, to a point where you're kind of comfortable with, right? You will never have 100% guarantees that like your portfolio will work out, but you may go from having a 60% guarantee to having 95% guarantee by using certain kind of a tricks um, that are known. Um, and then we moved on to smart contracts that we basically went through this kind of a mental discussion and identified that smart contracts or kind of this kind of technological means of automating things uh, remove the need for third party in terms of certain actions, right? We want that something happens uh, without relying on human factors. And blockchains themselves, which we kind of covered in the past, they remove that the trusted third party in terms of just a state, right? We like instead of trusting somebody to store certain state or certain ledger entry, we kind of have this guarantee done automatically. Uh, and that's what kind of a pure blockchains kind of offer. Um, but if you, you know, if you think about it and you have actions and you have state and actions can modify the state, well, you effectively have a compu computing platform, right? You can do computations, right? Uh, and that's what, um, you know, the, 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 the second half of the lecture was uh, kind of talking about the, the global computer, which is the Ethereum uh, or other smart contracts kind of um, setups that offer this computing facility, which doesn't rely on any trusted third party. Um, and I will not uh, go through the lecture. I, I leave the slides for those of you who are interested and want to learn more about um, Solidity and, and Ethereum. I just kind of highlight kind of um, the most important parts. So everything in the ledger and th th this, those points are specifically for Ethereum, but they are kind of um, also applicable to most smart based uh, blockchains that we currently have. Uh, so everything in the ledger is public. There is no way you can kind of uh, hide anyth anything. So all in method invocations, all the computation that you're doing, all the instructions that you're executing, all the state changes, everything is in plain text. Uh, and it's not only in plain text when it's happening, but it's in plain text forever because all the state changes, all those invocations are kind of stored in the blockchain and they are visible to everybody. Even if you, because smart contracts have a mechanism to say, okay, uh, the smart contract ends, like it finished, like it uh, achieved like a state that it's destroyed, right? But that doesn't mean that it disappears. It, it only means that it's like not active anymore, that no uh, body can send funds to it or um, invoked API calls on it. Uh, but the past interactions are still, still there. Um, if you need to hide information, you need to use encryption or hashing. Um, like you need to do um, hide what are you passing somewhere, right? Um, and then the other interesting property is that the smart contracts cannot be upgraded. You cannot have smart contract version 0 0.1 and then next week you found some bugs and you issued smart contract version 0 0.2. That's not possible. Like smart contract is 
just one version and it either works or it doesn't and there is no upgrade. Um, you can migrate from one contract to another and you can kind of, for example, uh, pass the calls from one contract to another, but you have to design and build that in into your contract uh, because there is no code upgrade, right? Um, so everything needs to be planned and encoded in advance, which makes software development, debugging and planning smart contract based applications quite different to your traditional software development. Um, everything uh, in terms of access control, who can do what, when, under what conditions also needs to be planned in advance. Because if you make a mistake here, the consequences are, you know, um, usually spectacular, like we had with the, the DAO from Ethereum. And then the, the reality of the decentralization because of those two points is that it's actually quite hard to have a true decentralization, right? Because someone somewhere in the code needs to be in charge of those upgrades or all those kind of things that can go wrong, right? Unless you really plan something never to go wrong, which may be risky in itself, right? Um, so making smart contracts kind of not relying on human factors at all is possible, but it, it, it is, uh, really difficult, right? For non-trivial cases. Like for example, with this bounty for hash collision, oh, there was no need for human factors. Like it was purely automated and very nicely done. But for more complex things, uh, things get really quickly very complex. So it's kind of difficult. All right, so I talked quite a lot. Uh, I have, uh, I am at the slide 28 and there is, you know, 83 slides left. <laughs> I mean, it's about 60 slides left. Um, so I think um, you can check things if you are more interested in this type of uh, work. And I hope you have a, bit, a better perspective of where this may fit into your work, right? Uh, if it makes sense to have some things automated or some things not relying on human uh, elements or trusted third parties. Um, so in some cases it is perfectly fine. And also for example, using um, Gitcoin for security bounties for your projects might be a good thing, right? So if you can, uh, if you having, contrib if you contributing or working with open source projects and you can see value in uh, opening up some sort of a bounties for um, security vulnerabilities or something like this, uh, that might be a good thing. Um, th there was one which I looked up yesterday, which was like increasing the uh, test coverage of a particular platform. That is quite nice because test coverage has a metric, especially if you're doing it with standardized tools. So you can easily measure it and you could almost fully automate like the, the bounty for, you know, increasing the test coverage or things like this. Um, so this, this is something to consider. All right, so that's all from me. Um, do you have any questions? If you have no questions, then what I will do is I will invite you to um, vote on the next lecture. And we will have uh, one more lecture, um, maybe one or two more lectures in the, in the course. And then one project review, maybe in about four weeks time, um, such that we get some sort of a milestone for, um, for the projects uh, before you will have to submit and then we will kind of wrap up the course, right? So I suggest uh, we spend some time here and on Discord discussing what to talk uh, for the next lecture. Um, and then we decide if we want one more and if not, we will do a project review. Uh, and then that, that will be it. Um, it is a little bit hard to have lectures that apply to all of you. Uh, so they, they need to be a little bit more generic, I, I guess. Um, but yeah, we will see how it goes. So yeah, thank you very much. And I will hopefully see you on Discord uh, through the week to discuss what we should talk next week. Yeah, thank you.